Hello, so today is going to be a hopefully quick guide on encounters. So encounters is basically like the main mechanic of this set and love it or hate it, I'll kind of talk about uh, a couple of them and a lot of the standout ones. Uh, obviously, I know the set is kind of going towards the end of its uh, life cycle here. Um, you know, there's only a couple weeks left of it, but this was a guide I was asked to make on my YouTube channel. My YouTube channel only started growing towards the... Uh, the later end of the set so you know as you can see we're almost close to our sub goal make sure to like and subscribe if you do like my content uh but anyways uh let's just go through them and give a little bit of a uh, basic strategy around some of the encounters that can help you guys in your end of set grind still useful information so um when you think about encounters encounters usually just give you something right they're usually either going to give you resources they're either going to alter the carousel they give you a combat effect and there's some of them that like rearrange shit they rearrange your whole board or they can change the game structure these are the ones that are the very like high variance encounters which we'll talk about um and some of them like you need to have like a certain strategy going into like a lot of the uh uh round one encounters you know the ones that starts the game off with an encounter that's what these ones kind of refer to um in terms in general encounters uh, often favor the greedy player um, a lot of times like you know you'll be like let's say like you're 2-1 and you have like a bunch of rounds right and then you see like a little swirly thing which is the encounter right this is like at the top of your game right you know it looks like this kind of and then like over here you have your shop you know I'm an artist by trade don't don't I'm drawing with my mouse okay don't don't take this as face value for accuracy but anyways um when you have these encounters, a lot of times, what I mean by it favors the greedy player is that the people that make very direct and early decisions, um, often if there's an encounter later in the game, which often happens, um, it's harder to play around that encounter because you already made decisive um, changes to your board, right? You either slammed items and then an encounter could come later and give you a component. Uh, you already pushed levels and then all of a sudden something comes up and says, hey, everything's going to cost less now for you to level and or roll and you already sent it, right? So a lot of times, as the player, you have to look at your position and say, hey, there's something that I want to do right now, but there's an encounter coming up. Do I greed for this encounter, or do I hope that it's not impactful um, to the general board that doesn't affect my positions a lot? Um, for a lot of reasons, uh, some people really like encounters, because if you're like someone who tends to want to wait to make decisions, and you like having more information, um, the variance and the fun that it adds is something that's really nice. Someone like me, um, I always favor to play aggressively, right? I'd rather throw away a first and get a guaranteed second than greed for a first and get like a fourth or a fifth, right? I'll always like, if I see like a guaranteed spot, even if it's not like the meta comp, the best comp, the best position, I'll always throw away some placements and say, hey, this is a guaranteed third or fourth. I'm just going to go for the third. I'm happy, right? Um, that's just my play style in lots of games, right? Um, that's me as a person, right? So when, when you have these encounters that a lot of times uh, I end up getting griefed by the encounters because I make decisions really early, I'll commit to something really early, I'll feel like my spot's really good for something, then an encounter comes in and messes it up sometimes, right? So, you know, part of me didn't really like this set that much. Take that into account. Obviously, there's going to be some bias when I talk about these things, right? There might be an encounter that I say, hey, this is a really big grief encounter, and you might say, hey, that's my favorite encounter, right? Um, you know, uh, that's, that's with the grain of salt of how I'm going to introduce this guy and i think it's important that you know that fact but overall i still enjoyed this i still had fun so you know i'm not gonna be like bitching the whole video that's what you know we can all relax a little bit uh anyways uh the game starts right um there's a couple really uh interesting game start options right so the first couple are kane yorick and darius uh, obviously, I'm just going to pick and choose some encounters that I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to go through every single encounter in the game for the sake of the length of the video, but uh, I'm going to try and mention some of them, and then you can extrapolate to the similar encounters. I tried to pick all the unique ones. Uh, whenever you're playing, like, for example, Kane, um, because the game ends really early, these ones really favor aggressive play, right? Um, especially early game, you're trying to preserve HP, and you're trying to play a really strong board. I have a video on my channel, which I'm not going to bring up here, but you can check it out if you want, where I play and talk about Kane Encounter. You can probably just go on my channel in the search bar and look up Kane Encounter, right? Um, and basically what I end up playing is I end up playing a Tempo Ghostly board, right? Whenever you see Kane, 5-4, um, it's technically really far away. Like, 5-4 is almost stage 6, right? You don't want to grief your game by, like, just, like, throwing away your gold, saying, the game's going to end, I need to be strong, because then you might run yourself into a rut. Um, the point is that you want to play aggressive, 
and you want to preserve HP, right? What that means is basically you just want to play your strongest board. You don't want to go for super greedy plays like playing Fortune. You don't want to sacrifice your HP and have like a really big loss streak because the HP that you have really matters in order to just guarantee that top four, right? Um, for what I played in my Kane video was Ghostly, right? Ghostly is a board where, yes, you can play Ghostly reroll, and yes, you can hit and you can miss and whatever. I played Tempo Ghostly. I kept up with the lobby in terms of leveling. And what I did with that uh, in that particular video was uh, Ghostly, which usually doesn't cap very high, right? Like, I would have probably gotten at best like a fourth because usually fall off really hard late game when people have a bunch of five costs. But because it, it spikes a lot earlier, uh, the whole lobby was still alive. Um, I didn't reroll anything. Like, I didn't have three star Shen. I didn't high roll anything. But I just played towards like a tempo board, right? Boards that are strong very early. I had so much HP that I ended up going first in that game. That's typically how Kane Encounter works. Uh, Yorick is a similar way. Uh, Yorick lets you uh, uh, field seven champions all the time. Uh, this is really good for rerolls because a lot of rerolls you want to roll on level six. These are like two cost rerolls. So, for example, Zyra and Lux, like these type of two cost rerolls. Uh, typically, you want to reroll on 6 and then go to level 7 and then play your uh, level 7 uh, unit just to get the extra synergies that really help cap out your board. Because Yorick lets you field 7 all the time, you can just roll on 6, preserve that gold, uh, field the 7 units that you hit, and you'll be really strong. Um, in general though, uh, whenever Yorick is, uh, appears, you want to play similar to Kane. You want to play uh, very strong boards. The reason is, is that there's going to be always 7 units on the field. So you're going to lose a lot of HP, right? If you lose in Yorick Galaxy, or you try and lost streak a lot in Yorick Galaxy, then you're going to uh, lose a bunch of HP because uh, everybody has so many units on their board that if you take a bad loss, you can take like a 7 unit loss on stage 2, right? And then you can just like, you'll lose so much HP like that that you won't be able to make it to late game, right? So stuff like Fortune and these greedy plays are typically less favored, right? Uh, the other encounter is Darius. Darius, this is a Spoils of War thing. This is another gripe I have with encounters of why I don't like them that much. Like, um, because certain uh, encounters give you certain effects, a lot of like augments, namely like prismatic augments that were like really like fun and s that I enjoyed to play around a lot, like Spoils of War and... Um, What's the other one? Like, Cruel Pact is gone, right? Like, there's a lot of encounter, a lot of uh, augments that got taken away this set because in lieu of, like, not synergizing well with encounters. This is one of those ones, but basically this is Spoils of War. If you've never played around Spoils of War, basically, um, when you kill a unit, you gain uh, loot, right? The loot is usually gold, uh, but later it can also be dupes uh, and components, right? So this is another galaxy where if you have a good spot for it, obviously in all of these, when you, when I say strong early, a reroll is a good idea. But it, uh, you have to have a spot for a reroll, else you'll grief your game anyways. But what I, what uh, Spoils of War usually favors is reroll, as well as boards that are strong early, because you basically get really far ahead by earning a bunch of extra gold, right? Uh, because of the Darius encounter, you'll basically gain resources for killing units. So you want to be strong in order to kill units, and then it also favors rerolls because eventually it will drop duplicators. And um, the lesser champion duplicators can help you hit your three-star units. So it synergizes really well with like a reroll. So you should always, in these ones, angle towards reroll. If you don't have a reroll spot, don't force it. But just always make sure that you're playing towards preserving HP, right? That's how all of these ones work. Um, the other two that exist is Zoe and Lilia. Um, or the other two big ones, right? Lilia is very weird because Lilia can either be non-impactful or it can absolutely grief the entire game, right? Because Lilia moves all the augments to random rounds. Sometimes you're playing the whole game without an augment. I recently played a Story Reaver game. It was like the second most recent Story Reaver game you can check out on my channel. Uh, what happens in that video was that Lilia appears or one of the uh, Lilia adjacent ones, right? Somebody that moves the augments around. And basically what ends up happening is you play a long part of the game without augments, right? Augments kind of help um, balance, like, by adding variance with augments, it might seem like uh, it makes it more like stagnant, which is true, but also makes it very high rolly the lobby, right? The boards that are really strong early, if there's no augment to help some of the people that are behind catch up, then what happens is the people that are very strong typically um, typically do better, right? So with Lilia Galaxy, you want to play similar to like Kane and those type of encounters. You want to be strong early because you don't know if. Um, Encounter, you won't know if the augment doesn't appear for a really long time 
And then it becomes something like an old uh, portal used to be called Stillwater Hold, where there was like no augments in the game. What ends up happening is a lot of people that are strong and re-rolling, they get further and further ahead because they just have a lot of HP and a lot of gold from winning lots of rounds. That the people that are behind have a really hard time to catch up without having some sort of augment spike or some kind of specific thing that helps their board out or average out the lobby a little bit. Um, so you'll have to be really cognizant of that. Now, what I do say is you need to play around the lobby, right? Lilia can easily drop, like, three augments in the same round as well, right? So if Lilia drops all your augments really early, then you have to make really uh, fast and strong decisions that uh, work relative to the lobby, right? So you have to be really cognizant of that. You have to be really aware. So there's not, like, one particular strategy, but typically you want to be strong early. Uh, the same thing applies for Zoe. Zoe, though, um, basically what she does is she makes only odd levels ex exist. So you start at level 3, then you can only go to level 5, level 7, or level 9. Uh, what I like to play in this board is boards that uh, favor a fast 9 board, right? Uh, not necessarily aggressive, not necessarily greedy, but you want to be able to fast 9 as soon as possible. Something like Story Weaver um, is something that I often lean towards in, these, uh, in this type of encounter, right? Uh, the reason you want to fast 9 is because if you're stuck on odd levels, typically you're going to be playing a level 7 board or a level 9 board. Level 7 boards are typically reroll, right? Uh, but there's not that many 3 cost rerolls that are particularly strong. A lot of 3 cost rerolls, you want to be a level 8. Think like Yone, Alune, um, even Duelists, right? A lot of times you want to get to level 8 so you can fit in like those extra traits and the extra units to synergize, right? A lot of them are contingent on hitting a 4 cost unit as well, which is sometimes hard to hit on level 7, right? Duelists, you need Lee Sin. Uh, Reapers, you need Kane. Uh, just giving some light examples, right? Um, so typically, like, when you get baited a lot of times thinking like, oh, there's only odd levels, I'll stay level 7, I'll reroll. The problem is if you don't hit, and the rest of the lobby is greeting. This is what I mean by play around the lobby, right? If your whole lobby is reroll and you try and go level 9, yes, you'll die because the whole lobby is reroll. They'll all spike early. They'll all be really strong. They'll all have a lot of HP. But if the rest of the lobby is greeting and you're rerolling, right? Rerollers help rerollers hit. So if nobody's rerolling with you, then nobody's helping you to thin out the pool. Nobody's making it easier for you to find your units, right? Because when people buy a bunch of three cost units, even if they're buying units that aren't your units, they're still removing them from the general pool. So it makes it easier for you to hit your units. Uh, that's why you really have to play around the lobby. That's why I put this. Typically, you want a fast nine. Right, because a lot of people are also greeting, then they're going to be level 9, they're going to get a bunch of legendaries, they're going to cap their board out really high, and then you might be stuck, you know, Tristana 2 star, thinking that you're going to reroll duelists, or Yone 2, uh, thinking you're going to reroll reapers, and then you just run into a situation where, well now I'm fucked, because everybody has legendary units upgraded, you know, Wukong 2 or Yone 2, who's better, right, with 3 items, right, a lot of times it's the Wukong, um, so that's why you have to really play around the lobby, but typically you're going for a fast 9 kind of board. You're trying to get to level 9 as soon as possible with 50 gold. You're trying to roll down on level 9 and create like a capped 4 cost board or specifically like one of those boards that works out well. Um, when you're fast 9ing, it also helps if you're strong early. I can't really just say like forehead be strong, right? But like if you have a story weaver opener, I would just commit to 7 story weaver, play towards Irelia, just go straight to 9, right? Because you'll have a strong opener and you'll preserve a lot of HP. Anyways, those are all the big encounters. Um, now we can go through some of the other ones and just talk about them here and there. Um, in terms of like other encounters, I want to put like the game alter encounters. Typically, these are ones that change your game plan. You usually have to play around them pretty well. Uh, for example, like Ash uh, basically makes it so that you can see your opponent. Uh, what this does is it reduces like the randomness of not knowing who your opponent is. So you have to focus a lot on positioning, right? If you're not properly positioning each fight, uh, you the other guy will be positioning each fight. You know who you're playing, right? So you have to be like very, very focused on like, okay, in this matchup, I need to do this. In this matchup, I need to do this, right? Fortune players, you know how strong you have to be because I'm playing this guy. I know that I can play this many units and I'll be quite strong, etc. Right? Um, Ari is uh, this is an example of a greed, right? Um, a lot of times you might be playing the game. I'm sure everybody in TFT has had this experience. And if you didn't, you're lying to yourself. But everybody in all ranks would have had a game where it's like, man, if I only had like five more HP, I would have won this game. If I only had 10 more HP, I would have made it to level nine. I would have won this game. That's what Ari gives you, right? And it really depends on when it happens, right? If Ari happens really early, it's really easy to play around the greed. Um, if Ari happens really late in the game, then it can absolutely fuck the game. 
right? The game could be absolutely destroyed because uh, what can happen is like a lot of people that you're like, oh yeah, that guy's dead in one turn. All of a sudden, he's not dead in one turn. And all of a sudden, he caps out his board. He makes it to level nine and he just like fucking wins the lobby, right? Sometimes it's a fortune player. Boom, Ari comes. Great, the fortune player now gets to cash out and gets to win the game, right? Um, it, it can grief the game really badly. This is why this is one of the like, you know, encounters like this are ones that I hate because they can drastically change the placement of the game where like most of how you played the game before this encounter showing up uh, doesn't matter, right? Because it can absolutely like just like shuffle everything around. Um, but anyways, uh, if it happens early or happens late, you have to try and play around that, right? You have to understand that if Ari's kiss occurs, um, even though it might not look like it, uh, the game might just last a little bit longer. People might live a little bit longer and you have to be aware of that. So if you're playing a board that doesn't cap very high, you have to kind of alter what you're doing, right? You have to think to yourself, okay, how can I cap this board to keep up with everybody else? Do I send it now? Do I send it early? Make sure I preserve HP right now before they spike just so I can try and outlive somebody. Do I greed with them so that I can also maybe make it to a higher level and spike, right? You have to make those decisions based on your board, which is very difficult. I don't have particular examples. If you want to see examples of how I play around each encounter, and having talk about it, I would post VOD reviews every single day, right? A lot of people, you, know, you might want like a condensed guide, but like, just like if you're just a comp that you really want to play and I have a VOD about it, I will talk through the entire VOD. I'll talk about positioning. I'll talk about the unit placements. I'll talk about uh, items. I'll talk about item management. I'll even talk about what I did right or wrong and what I think could have done better. Uh, those are the best ways to learn like specifics about each thing, right? This is just gonna be like a general overarching and then you can check out the daily VODs and see like, oh, in this game, what encounters did he see? How did he play around them, etc. And that's how you can kind of learn those aspects, at least if you're trying to learn from me. Um, anyways, this Irelia one's also grief. Basically, uh, next to these drops contain one of each cost. Uh, it doesn't really matter for a lot of things, but for, for certain rerolls as well as um, certain boards that require a specific 5 cost, this can just give you the 5 cost. A lot of times the game gets decided on who hits whatever 5 cost. Sometimes people literally, like if they have like a duplicator or something like that, depending on what type of game it is, sometimes people just win the game on the spot because they get like an upgraded legendary unit out of nowhere. Right, this can happen as early as stage 4. So you're playing stage 4, you just did your roll down, you spent all your gold, all of a sudden... Irelia appears and then everybody gets like five cost units. So now everybody's board is going to cap a little bit higher and you have to play around that, especially if you're not playing a board that necessarily needs a five cost. Um, you have to like decide, okay, do I send it deeper now? Do I have to go for upgrades? Am I still playing for a top four? What's happening? Right. Uh, the other one is Darius for the same reason. Darius basically makes it so that everybody hits their board. Uh, Darius typically is favored a lot more for rerolls. This is like a Pandora's bench. Um, this used to be, uh, this used to be an augment that you can take. Right, and then I think they removed it because too broken. But basically, um, it changes units to the same cost on bench uh, to other units that are the same cost from on bench. So you have to be really aware of the fact that. Um, oh, also I have a background. I can remove that. One second. There we go. That's a little bit nicer. Um, when you're playing around these uh, Darius, basically, like it can help you hit the uh, the four cost slash five cost that you might need. So it can favor everybody. Uh, but typically it favors rerollers because what you do is you basically upgrade a champion, right? Like, let's say you make a two, uh, upgrade a two star, right? You, you, make, you make like a two star, um, I don't know, let's pick a unit. Ma let's say you make a two star Amumu and you put it on bench. What that will roll into is roll to another two star three cost unit, right? I recently played an Umbral game that I did that. Uh, basically what you do, it's on my channel, uploaded somewhere, but basically I upgraded a bunch of two star, two, uh, three cost units, and then they eventually rolled into a loon, and then I got a free a loon three without having to roll that much. Uh, so Darius can really spike boards, right? If you're a re-roller, it can spike your board. If you're playing around a four or five cost, it can also spike your board because it can give you those units and free upgrades. Uh, also it can make it so that people randomly hit, uh, three star four costs because basically the same way you can re, uh, the same way you would re-roll for a three star unit. Um, you can do that with a 4 cost as well. You can put a bunch of upgraded 4 costs. If you're high rolling and you have a bunch of gold, you put a bunch of upgraded 4 costs and then you just collect all the ones of the same unit that you want. So that's why I mean it's very game altering. You have to be ready to play around. You can't be like, oh, Darius appeared. I'm just going to continue doing what I'm doing. It's like, no, I have to like start putting shit and rolling shit and deciding like what I'm going for, right? If I'm not going for a reroll, am I going for a 3 star 4 cost? Am I going for something else, etc. Right? Anyways, uh, now we could go to the common fun ones. 
So these are the ones that they just give you resources and they're like a little bit fun to play around, right? Especially the Tom Kench one. I actually love the Tom Kench one. It's so much fun. You know, like he gives you like a little mini game to play like Mario Party. I think it's a really nice addition to the game. And then there's the one like Kabuko. You just go in. Um, the main thing that you should always know is you participate if it benefits you, right? If you're win streaking and you're far ahead of everybody else, um, these are resources, right? They give people resources and you don't know if those resources are going to help other boards spike. You don't know if they're going to help other people do better in the game, right? Um, you, you don't necessarily want to do that. Um, you, so sometimes you abstain from it just to make sure that the cash out is a little bit worse, right? Even though it might, um, help you spike as well. If you're already ahead of the lobby, right? If you're already like, for example, playing for a first or playing for a top four, you really don't want somebody that's like on the fringes of survival, getting something that helps them become stronger, right? So a lot of times, uh, you know, as fun as they are, the correct play a lot of times is if you're doing really well, just not to participate and uh, make sure that the rest of the lobby doesn't get as many uh, resources from them. Hello, sorry for jump cut. Uh, just had an error that I had to edit. So anyways, when we're talking about um, resource choices, um, one of the big ones, there's many different versions of this that basically just give you options. Like you can either buy X thing, you can get either gold or health. They all kind of work out the same. Um, often HP and gold are the best. Uh, sorry, when I say HP, I mean like unit HP. Um, but typically uh, gold is the best, right? Um, how, how can I explain it? Let's just go through these examples and as well as on the next slide, and I'll kind of explain it a little bit better. So here, Aatrox offers you component anvil, player health, or gold, right? Uh, when I say health is good, I don't mean this health. Uh, we'll see later. Sorry, I don't want to be confusing with the slide. Um, basically, the main thing is uh, it's usually between component anvil and gold for Aatrox, right? Uh, when you talk about component anvil and gold, uh, gold is really good early, and this is situationally good, right? situational right um so the reason gold is good early is because you want to be making like 30 gold as soon as possible because 30 gold makes 40 gold really easily i talk about this a lot you kind of hear it as a meme like 30 uh, 30 40 50 right but basically 30 gold because it gives three interest as well as the round um depending on the round win and how much streaking you're already at typically you can get like as much as like six or seven gold fairly fairly easily from like a round so with the three gold of interest, you'll easily make the next interest threshold, which is 40, which will then make the next interest th threshold of 50, but for the same reason, right? Um, making 50 gold is really important because the more turns that you're making 50 gold, the more turns you're getting five gold of interest. Uh, every gold matters and it starts to get like exponentially uh, greater for you, right? If you're a very greedy player, ideally you're making 50 gold every single round. And that is uh, giving you as much gold as possible. And gold translates to buying units, rolling for units. It eliminates a lot of the variance, right? The more gold that you have, like, you know, if you have only 10 gold to roll for a four star, a uh, four cost uh, versus 50 gold for, to roll for a four cost, obviously you're going to have a greater chance of hitting whatever you want to hit with more gold. So it's very important to make the gold early. So whenever you see a, um, whenever you see a choice that gives you the option of gold, and you have the option to take gold if it's early game so like if you're not like established your game yet you didn't establish econ yet um taking the gold is often the most important thing and it's almost always like a guaranteed take if a truck shows up it's always take gold early right now sometimes uh you want to take a component anvil uh you only really take a component anvil if it spikes you early right sometimes you might be in a very particular spot where you're wind streaking and you see a component anvil and you say to yourself okay like it's either eight gold but i'm already making 40 i'm already making 50 right i'm already i already have a lot of gold because i've been winning so many rounds this component anvil i can make another completed item which gives me a better chance of streaking here as well as keeps up with the rest of the lobby in case somebody else takes a component and spikes right then you might be consider taking a component anvil right health the only reason you would take this i think is usually like if you're like on the, like you know if you're playing super greedy or your fortune you're gonna die right but it's very often negligible and not important because like you know um if you're the only one that takes health everybody spikes their board by more uh value than you would need health uh the component anvil though this is extremely good late game um if you have odd components right uh, what I mean by that is a lot of times, um, right, uh, I think it's after round, well, round four is uh, birds, so at the start of round five, right, 5-1, five, uh, the carousel has completed items, right? Not 5-1, but 5-5 five, five or whatever it is, right? Um, after a certain point, you no longer get any more components, and everything that gets dropped to you is a completed item. 
and uh, and sometimes on your bench right if this is your game and you have your little bench you have a leftover component right that leftover component doesn't really do that much it doesn't give that much in terms of stats it doesn't give that much in terms of abilities but if you get a component anvil um what it can do is can complete that item and making that completed item especially late game is going to be so much more that's why sometimes these are very greedy um uh, favors a lot of greedy choices but like if Aatrox appears really later uh, Aatrox appears at a certain point that's a lot later Aatrox in particular in this case uh, appears stage 4 so it might it won't necessarily happen by the time like you have perfect info if you have odd or even components so it's harder to tell with Aatrox but there's other um, examples of this like uh, for example Lissandra where you can buy a component anvil um, that it's very strong if you don't have if you have like a leftover component that you can make a completed item then it becomes very strong but you won't know that until like around stage five so it's uh you know uh use your best judgment right is what i can say um but either way uh for example the is a little bit different because you have to spend you have to spend gold in order to gain these items and anvils uh the artifact anvil is often bait just because 22 gold is so much gold and the thing with an artifact anvil is that there's so many ones that you can miss, especially if you're committed to a certain comp already. You can just pop open the artifact anvil and it could be like fucking prowlers and some other shit that's unusable. And then you're just like, well, I just spent literally like 22 gold, which is a shit ton. That is a lot. That is like 10 whole shops, right? That is so much gold. So it often doesn't spike you. So this one's almost a never a take unless you really want to like fuck roll the dice and have fun and high roll. But it really doesn't work out very often. Uh, but the 12 gold for a component anvil works out the same way, right? Um, if it appears at such a point where you know that you have odd components and you can make a completed item off of it, this 12 gold is insanely cheap for such a strong uh, upgrade, right? Having a completed item, so long as it's not like absolute dog shit that's unslammable, um, any completed item just puts you significantly further ahead in a lot of fights. So it's very, very important. Um, and that's something you should always like keep in mind late game, you know at that point You know unless you're in dire straits that you cannot buy from Lissandra um, The completed the component anvil often is really good in those situations um, Then in terms of resource storage, this is one that I wanted to talk about um, So I don't know exactly which ones they are I tried looking it up and I, I couldn't find it. I, I saw it on Twitter once but I, I'm pretty I know attack for sure is um, So um, this one grants you two components. They're always the same components, right? So this is glove and sword. Um, magic is uh, a rod plus tier, right? Um, like uh, rod and tier, and I think defense is belt plus um, belt plus chain, chain mail. These are the components you get. They're always the same. Um, so take the one that best suits you, right? Even though like you you know you might be playing Ash. And you think, oh, attack is good for Ash, right? But if you don't have a Gwinsu and you already have like an IE on Ash, an IE, uh, Infinity Edge is Glove and Sword, right? If you already have these, then it might be like, oh, I'll, I'll take Magic because the Rod is like half a Gwinsu and I need a Gwinsu or half a Morello and I need Anti-Heal, right? Like stuff like that. So it's important to know what you get off of these particular resources so that you just make the right choice, right? Um, Kindred, for example, Red, it's a red buff. So that's the the item with bobo anti heal uh, double bow item plus a uh, remover right so it gives uh, sorry not a remover um plus a reforger it gives you a reforger as well so a reforger basically lets you like convert one item into another item so it gives you a red buff and a reforger uh blue gives you a uh you guessed it a blue buff and a uh it gives you a, a duplicator a lesser duplicator Right, so especially if you're like re-rolling, right? This blue one is really good. It gives you a duplicator as well, right? Even if you don't necessarily need the blue buff, uh, it gives you like an extra item, right? Or an extra consumable, right? It gives you a, either a duplicator or a reforger. So based on your spot in the game, right? Especially this reforger one, this one works out really well because even if you like, let's say you already have a red buff and you don't need a red buff, but if you have like a bunch of useless items that you need or components that you need to rearrange, the reforger is really strong in certain comps, right? Because you can basically just reforge the red buff plus something else if you already have anti-heal or you can reforge your other anti-heal item if you have a Morello and you don't want to use it or a Sunfire. So the reforger works out really nicely. So just be aware that you get those as well and make the choice of what you think works best in your spot. Um, then in terms of encounters, there's other encounters that give you gold, right? Like Tristana, 
Um, it's either free or conditional, right? Sometimes it asks you about like streak or it gives you like we'll talk about Annie a little bit later. Uh, but typically whenever you see gold, it favors the people that are already streaking a lot of the time. Um, like obviously if somebody just sent it, uh, it can help them reestablish their econ. But a lot of times it's like if you're already like far ahead, the gold helps you to get further ahead. If you're already like lose streaking and you're making a bunch of gold like that, the extra gold helps you to like, you know, be able to send it even more. Um, especially if you're win streaking and loss streaking, stuff like Senna really matters because if you're like playing a weak board, you know that you're going to loss streak, so this is just worth it. Or if you're like uh, win streaking, you know that you can win streak, so this is just nice, right? Uh, but sometimes they're like non important. Uh, sorry, if you're already like loss streaking or win streaking, you probably just take the three gold anyways because you know that you're like it doesn't matter, you're already at a six streak, right? But they're very situational. A lot of times, like, you know, if Senna comes at the right moment, it can really help you, like, get a lot of money if you're, like, playing aggressively. But I find that a lot of times, like, whenever you get gold, if you're somewhere in the middle of the pack and you get gold, um, a lot of times, like, the people that are already ahead will have more gold to hit their stuff, and the people that are behind will have, like, a definite amount of gold to help stabilize. So I find that doesn't benefit me a lot of times when I'm in the middle of the pack, unless I, like, just sent it, right? Like, if I just, like, if I just, like, picked this and rolled my board... Sometimes you do that, right? If you're somebody that, like, these are the type of augments where, like, you can make a decision, right? So, for example, if Senna appears, and I'm like, do I send it this turn or next turn? This might be, a, like, an example of, like, okay, Senna appeared, I roll now, right? Like, I say I'm gonna win streak, I send it to zero, I try and hit my three-star unit, or my whatever unit, and I just send it, right? And then I try and reestablish my econ because they gave me a win streak already, so then I'll just make, like, five gold if I win this turn, right? So it becomes really important, or 3 gold or 4 gold, right? Uh, so these can like alter your decision on whether or not you send it now, you send it later, but you have to like keep up with the lobby. I find that it benefits if you're already streaking because it's a little bit easier to predict and stuff. Um, but like, you know, if you're like middle of the pack and you're not quite strong, not quite weak, then this becomes really useless to you, right? That's what I mean, but you know, it can you can play around it. Um, there's also like encounters for rerolls and units, right? Some of them on the carousel just give you a bunch of units. You can always treat it like gold, so it's not that bad. But it does favor like reroll spots really well. Obviously, if like there's two, uh, if there's two star three costs or two stars two costs units on carousel, they can just easily hit their board and become really strong. Uh, but a lot of times when it gives you like rerolls that you can use either this round or a later round, um, it's often really helpful not only for rerollers but just hitting your own board. Uh, when there's rerolls uh, that only last this round, right? Um, it can also influence you to send it, right? If you're like on the fence of like, mm, I'm gonna send it either this turn or next turn, a lot of times if an encounter like this appears, it's like, okay, now I should send it. Uh, the biggest grief is when you already make a decision and like a zero happens like the turn after you already had to roll your gold because you were low HP and you couldn't greed for it. Um, that's when it doesn't benefit and that's when it's like kind of frustrating. It's like, oh great. It's like I just spent all my gold roll like and now you're giving me free rerolls, you know? It's like that kind of sucks. Um, you know, or you already hit your board and it's like now the rest of the lobby can catch up. Uh, combat. So, um, Alune is one of the big combat ones that appears often, right? Basically, she'll either empower 2 cost, 3 cost, or 4 cost champions. Obviously, you just pick the one that you're playing towards. But you can also change your game plan to favor towards another one, right? If you were thinking to yourself, mm, I might reroll three costs or I'll play four costs or I might reroll this two costs and then maybe level up. It's often better uh, to go for the reroll with the Alun, in my opinion. Because the thing is, um, when Alun appears, she usually appears stage two or three, which is very early in the game. If you're playing around a four cost, you're probably not going to um, use Alun's effects until a lot later. So uh, the, it favors the rerollers because if you're playing around these units, like the two and three cost units, you're getting an immediate combat effect that immediately makes you stronger. So if you're on the fence, if you have the option to play a two cost reroll and you have like, let's say you have like five copies of Lux and you're like, mm, do I play Lux or do I just sell these and play Lilia? It's like if this shows up, it's like, yeah, I probably want to play Lux in this spot because... Uh, I'm going to be stronger right now as well, right? If something makes you immediately stronger, it eliminates some of the variants that could happen later because you basically preserve HP, uh, streak, win streak, hopefully, and uh, do a lot better at that particular point. Uh, there's other ones that are a little bit more awkward combat. So, for example, this Ari one. Uh, Ari, you either take health on units. This is what I was talking about before, but I just messed up the slide. Um, there's health, ability power, attack damage. 
I know it always looks tempting of like, ooh, I take AP or AD because I'm playing AP or AD. It's often always health. You can never really go wrong with health, right? The other ones, you don't know what's going to happen if you have to pivot or if you hit certain augments, right? Like, let's say you take ability power and then you hit, like, augments that give you ability power, right? It's diminishing returns. Or let's say you already have items that give you a lot of ability power. It's hard to play around depending on when it comes, when, when this appears, right? It could appear anywhere from stage 2 to 5. Uh, health is always good. It just makes all your units tankier. They all live longer. Um, health is really good. Uh, backline units, there's a lot of backline access, right? There's a lot of comps like Lilia. There's a lot of comps like Lux. There's a lot of comps like Yone, right? There's units that just like throw themselves at your backline and try and kill your backline, right? Like Lilia snipes shit all the time. Irelia as well, right? Having HP on your whole board is very very underestimated a lot of times especially if you're like just starting out at the game you might not think that it's that important it's like oh why do i need more health it's like it's fine right uh it, it's very substantial right for not only preserving your backline carries being alive uh but also for just making your whole board harder to kill and it's often like a lot better than the other two options here um and it's also a lot safer to take because you don't know if something's gonna happen right especially if you get like augments and diminishing returns and how your items work out so often it's usually just take hp um obviously if you have a spot where you like you know already have a bunch of hp like let's say you have like i don't know like bruisers as your front line or some shit like that even but bruisers scale off hp that's like a bad example um because they scale off percentage hp so more hp helps them as well by a lot there's certain situations where you might think that my team is already tanky enough right like for example if you're playing like uh seven mythic is an example right if you're playing towards 7 Mythic, 7 Mythic gives your units a bunch of HP already, as well as your whole unit is AP. So then it makes sense to take ability power in this case, right? Because um, even though like the HP makes your whole board tankier, you already have a lot of tankiness because of playing 7 Mythic. And the ability power basically buffs literally everybody, like your entire board uses AP, right? So because your entire board uses AP, AP, like your frontline units are going to be tankier, your backline units are going to do more damage. Like it, it's just insane. It's good for everybody, right? That's like an example where you would take like AP over HP, right? Uh, anyways. Uh, oh, grief augments. Oh, baby, it's time. Oh, fucking skip five minutes ahead in the video if you don't want to hear me bitch about Kha'Zix again. I bitch about Kha'Zix like once a week on minimum. I fucking hate this guy. I, they removed him from the game, but he's still in the game. He can still appear sometimes. I don't understand why. Like, why the fuck is this? Uh, I, oh, I'm going to lose my shit. If I had to quit the set, it's because of Kha'Zix, right? I think, like, you know, if, if I say my enjoyment of the set, I would say it's, like, average, right? If they remove Kha'Zix, it goes above average. I swear to God, every time this guy appears, I'm pissed off. This is the worst encounter in the game. Uh, some people, like, hate other stuff. I, I understand it. Obviously, like, maybe, like, to each their own. But fuck this guy. It, it literally only favors greed, right? Yorick isn't even as bad as Kha'Zix. I put them on the same slide. They shouldn't. Kha'Zix deserves a special slide just for him, right? Basically, what Kha'Zix does, it makes it like 25% cheaper to level up. It literally only favors people that are greeting. There is no point in the game where you're like, ooh, Kha'Zix appeared. This is great. I'm so happy. The only time you're happy is if you're like full greeting and you haven't sent it yet. And I think that's just bad for the game, right? Now, don't get me wrong. I've, I've benefited from Kha'Zix. There's a video on my channel. Um, I think it's the first Kabuko game. The first Lucky Pause game that's on my channel. Kha'Zix appeared and I went straight to level 10 and I got a first. Right? I, I, I'm, I'm not... And uh, the most recent Kabuko video, I think I posted it yesterday. I got Kha'Zix and I, I did the same thing. I went straight to level 9. I was Kabuko reroll and it worked out. Right? I'm saying that even when it benefits me, it pisses me off. That's why I hate it. Because basically what happens is, um, whoever has gold can just level up straight to like really high capping boards, like level 8, level 9. The biggest distinguisher with a lot of boards, like whether you're playing reroll, whether you're playing forecast, whether you're playing like anything, the biggest gold investment that you need to do a lot of times is leveling up, right? When you're playing a reroll, how do you cap your board? Going level 8, going level 9. If you're playing a forecast, how do you cap your board? Going level 9. If you're playing like any board, the best way to cap that board out is to level up. If you already use your gold, you can't play around Kha'Zix every game. You can't say, I'm never going to spend gold until I see an encounter. You have to decide what's best for you at a certain point in time. But it just, it just fucks up the game. Because all the people that have the gold, 
now they can like roll with better shot bots. They can just go straight to nine. There's so many games where Kha'Zix appears and, and everybody's like level 10 in the board in the game and it just it just messes things up, right? If there's a fortune player, it's just like it, it clearly benefits whoever just didn't send it yet, but you can't decide to send it later, right? It, it's it, That's why it's like a grief thing, right? It's the same with like Yorick, right? But Yorick's a little bit different because it reduces the cost to reroll your shop. Which obviously, like, it sounds like it favors, like, rerollers a lot. It favors everybody in a way, because, like, even if I'm rolling for a 4 cost, having less money spent on finding those 4 cost units is really good for me as well, right? Uh, but it's not as bad as Kha'Zix, because as much as, like, the rerolling is decreased in price, um, it's still very hard to, like, cap out your board with leveling up. And, you know, as much as Jorik reduces the cost that many people can hit, like, especially reroller bo uh, boards can, like, hit their board a lot easier... It doesn't make as drastic as a change, and at least in the games I've played as Kha'Zix, right? Uh, but it still can grief your game, because if you spent all your gold, let's say you just rolled for all your 4 cost units, and then 2 turns later Yorick appears, it's like, well, great, now everybody who didn't roll yet is going to be so much richer than me, and have the potential to cap out their board, right? Um, so that's why I hate these ones, right? They can very change. They can change the game, they're very hard to plan around, and for me, at least, they're not fun, right? It's not like Tom Kench, where you come and you play the Mario Party mini game, and I'm fucking smiling every time, right? Tom Kench appears, it doesn't matter how bad the game's going, I'm never like, fuck Tom Kench. I'm always like, oh, hell yeah, the homie's here. Let's play a little bit, right? And there's lots of encounters that are like that, that they're like still fun to play around. But like these ones, it's like no matter when they appear, it's like I'm either going to win the game for free or I'm going to lose the game for free. And that's how it feels. And it's like if I always want to play like a slot machine, I'll pull out a fucking slot machine, right? It's like I don't get it. Yeah, I hate these ones. Anyways. Uh, ja so the, but the main thing about this slot is that you can't really play around them, right? The best thing you can do is that if you see an encounter coming up, you can wait just in case. But, like, it's very situational, right? You can only wait if you're high rolling, right? If you're, like, really far ahead and you're like, yeah, I have, like, 100 HP. I can wait for the encounter to roll or I can wait for the encounter to level up. Then if these guys show up, you win on the spot anyways. So it's like, if you can play around them, you're probably in a spot where they're going to benefit you. And if you can't play around them, you're fucked anyways because then everybody else who can play around them is going to play around them and they're going to be ahead of you. <sighs> okay, I'm done. Okay, next one. Uh, Janna. So, Janna gives you two Zephyrs. A lot of people hate this one. I don't hate it that much, but basically, um, Zephyrs uh, lift up like units. It just makes the game really RNG because if you know who you're playing against and you can play against them, then you can put up the, then you can place the Zephyrs and just like fuck over your opponent in the specific matchup and like win. A lot of times there's tech where you put this on like a shitter, and then you sell it and you can like cycle the Zephyrs, right? So you can wait till the fight starts then place the Zephyrs in the spot that, like, uh, grief your opponent. And then you can, like, it, it can just sway fights that uh, that otherwise wouldn't be swayed. So it adds a lot of, like, RNG. It's very difficult to play around because basically, like, you know, you just have to guess a lot of the time. Um, or you have to, like, randomly grief your positioning and then it might fuck up with, like, a different fight. So this one in general is just, like... It's just like not that great to play around, right? It doesn't really add any benefit besides saying like, oh, now I cannot properly predict predict the fight outcome because I have to like do all this crazy shit to play around. But there's like, you know, there's some skill involved, obviously, like if you know how to cycle Zephyrs or if you have a remover already or something like that. But in general, it's just like, oh, great. Like anything can happen now, right? It's one of those, which is why it's like in this grief spot. Uh, then there's a the carousel grief ones. Uh, this Irelia one is the one I hate the most uh, in terms of carousel encounters. Basically, she allows everybody to move freely on the carousel. Uh, this sucks. This actually punishes uh, last picks, right? Imagine if you're lose streaking because you're trying to get a particular item and you're really hoping that you can lose streak and get this uh, particular item. Uh, and then all of a sudden, Irelia shows up. It's like you just lost streaked for no reason, right? The whole point of lose streaking is you have the carousel pick that helps compensate to help make you stronger. It's like a comeback mechanic in the game. And this completely removes it, right? It completely makes it like, hey, RNG, you can just get whatever you want. Like, imagine if you don't have a tier and you want to play towards some sort of AP line. And you're like, okay, great. I just lost every fight, right? I'm 50 HP. Everybody else is like 100 HP. I can't wait to get to Carousel, get my tier, and maybe play for a top four. And then all of a sudden, Irelia comes and you're like guaranteed eighth because you just don't get the item you need. It's just so miserable. So, yeah, this one sucks. Uh, you can't really play around it either, right? If you see a carousel encounter, like, there's nothing to do. It just shows up, and you're just like, okay, great. Uh, the other one's like Teemo, for example, right? 
Uh, you can't really just play around the fact you're gonna get a spatula ever. So what ends up happening is if Teemo shows up in the spatula, if your board spikes with a spatula, you're in a good spot. If it doesn't spike with a spatula, like let's say you're playing like some board that doesn't use spatulas, right? Let's say you're playing like Trickshot Kaisa, right? You get a spatula, what are you making? A Story Weaver emblem? Like there's nothing you can really make that's gonna help your board out, right? And then somebody else just like hits like eight ghostly or six ghostly or some guy has a mythic spat golden spatula occurs he's 10 mythic you know what i mean like it's really awkward right um and the same thing with orn artifacts right a lot of times like these ones like whenever you have like these carousels uh they favor the person that's lost streaking right they favor the person that's greeting right just like holding on to their money not rolling uh have a weaker board and you're trying to spike later right the person that's gonna all in later because the thing is, like, there's so many Orn artifacts that are completely useless, and there's so many of them that are very, very strong, right? Imagine this suspicious trench coat, right? That's like that fits into almost every team as being like a really, really strong spiking item. The same with like Eternal Winter, right? Some of the frontline items are just very fucking strong, right? If your first pick on a carousel and Orn appears and he just puts artifacts, versus if your last pick on the carousel, there's no real way you can play around it, right? You can't tell yourself, oh, I'm just gonna lose streak every single game until I see all the encounters in the game. Right, but that's what I mean by it usually favors like a greedy play. Um, that's why I really don't like this one. Uh, we're close. We're coming towards the end, uh, but basically we have this one, which is just like the larger choices. Um, so for example, like Annie, I said I would talk about it a little bit later. Uh, but basically, you either double your interest or your shops are a level higher. The level higher is very bait, but it does come into play in certain situations, right? I've seen people like take one level higher shop because it occurs on stage three. Uh, depending on when it occurs, um, you might not be able to make it to level four, um, right? So like a lot of times you'll be like, it, what I mean is like you might not make it to stage four. The encounter might burn out before then, but a lot of times like you'll be like level seven, and then what that what it basically means when the one shop higher means that you'll have the odds of like a level eight board. Um, it seems very grief because a lot of the boards where you're playing towards level 8, they usually need the, the space to fit in the units on level 8. But sometimes, like especially if you're contested, um, you might want to just roll earlier um, and use like your, uh, and basically like just like roll on level 7 for your 4 costs. Like I've seen that strategy work out sometimes. I know it sounds really troll, but I saw Dish, so Dish Soap do it and he's like number 1 in NA right multiple times like he's very very good at the game and he was explaining that sometimes it makes sense but often it doesn't make sense and i agree with that right and he, like you know in his game he went like giga first by rolling on seven in that one particular spot but i would say be very warned a lot of time it's very bait right um the best case scenario is if you can be level eight uh, if you know that you can be level eight then you can just use the higher level shop to roll with level nine odds like this is very good for like kaisa for example, right? When you're playing a Kaisa board that you really contingent on hitting a Zaya, if you can do like your level 8 roll down with the odds of level 9 roll down, that helps you tremendously in terms of hitting your 4 cost and your 5 cost. But this is very situational. It's very, very, like of the, the rounds, like it, ha it literally has to appear on round 7 for that to work out a lot of the time. Because like it, the, the, the encounter just dies too early if it occurs at an earlier round in the, in the, uh, in the game, right? So you have to be very cognizant of that. Uh, the double of your interest, obviously, if you're in a spot where like your wins, win, lose, win, lose, win, lose, um, it's not that good. But if you're in a spot where you're like, you know that you're lose streaking, you know that you're win streaking, then this is extremely strong, right? Um, so it, it's like you, you can definitely grief yourself with the level higher thing, but like the interest is usually good, even if you're not like. You know, double your interest, still double your interest, but it, it could definitely, like, make, like, a really bad situation worse if, like, you know, there's a guy lose streaking fortune, and then he just doubles his interest, he gets, like, 14 gold every round or some shit. Uh, you know, that's kind of nutty, or somebody's win streaking like that. It, it, it's, it could grief the lobby a lot. Uh, but anyways, I just thought I'd put it here to talk about, because it's one of the unique ones. Uh, Cho'Gath is in a similar way, right? Um... Trogath, basically what he does, you lose a shop slot forever. This is not only, uh, not only is it like, if you're going reroll, it's like really fucking bad. But even if you're going like non-reroll, it can severely damage your game, right? This one really favors a high roll spot. Uh, but the problem is, gaining three component anvils is very strong. Because even if you don't use all, like obviously it's similar to like the last one, right? Um, if you're stage five, 
and you have like a spare component on your bench, three component anvils can equate to two completed items, right? Because if you have a spare component that's like, because you have an odd amount of components that one's just sitting on your bench, three components is very fucking strong. Even if you don't have um, an extra component, three components does give you like a full completed item. So it spikes boards really hard, right? If you already hit your board, it's almost, a, you always have to take this, right? Uh, it's like, basically like this Cho'Gath encounter, it's like, if you can manage to take it, you have to take it. Because it's it puts people so far ahead in the lobby that you're going to be fucked if you don't do it, right? Um, and that's the problem where like it really favors high roll. It really favors if you like already have a board. Um, not necessarily like greeting or anything like that. It's just a matter of like, if you can afford to take this and you you still if you already hit your unit basically you you take this always if you didn't hit the units that you're playing then you're kind of forced to not take it but just know that your game's gonna be a lot harder right that that's that that's the gist of it so it's like it, it's all over the place it's so hard when this guy shows up it, it is a very difficult choice uh the other one's like darius right 10 free reels or 20 xp both are very strong uh, so both will spike the board. Just make sure you utilize it well, right? Either you take 20 XP and you're going like a fast extra level, right? To level up. Or um, you, you just, if you're not going to level up, right? If you're stuck on level 8 um, and you and you didn't hit your board yet, then the 10 rerolls can really help you to stabilize and guarantee a placement, right? So you just have to take whichever one were the same thing, right? You really want to take the 20 XP if you can, but if you didn't hit your board, you have to settle for the rerolls, right? Um, and then the same with Rakan. Rakan is like a little bit more random. Sometimes it can work out really well. Um, obviously, taking five gold. Uh, what he does, he recombobulates the board, right? Depending on when he shows up, uh, it can absolutely grief the game. I think they nerfed it. I think he could show up a little bit later before. And now they made him that he only shows up now. Um, like a little bit earlier. Like he only shows up on stage two. Um, so like this really favors you. Obviously, if you're high roll, if you find an early four cost unit. I always encourage people to hold on to four costs as much as possible, even if it's not the one that you're playing particularly. A lot of times you can play around most four costs, even in different setups, um, at least to stabilize. So try and hold on to four costs. Um, but either way, basically, if you recombob uh, and you get like a free five cost, you can get really, really far ahead of the lobby, right? Sometimes um, it's stage two. Um, I think it can appear on stage three, if I'm not mistaken, though. Uh, but sometimes it just works out really awkwardly, like if someone has like a lot of copies of a particular unit, or if they early high roll into some random four cost, then they just recombob, and then they're just like really far ahead, and they're like guaranteed first, right? I think I had a Rakan recombob me into a Huawei one time, and it was really good. I didn't go first though, because I didn't high roll the rest of it. Like I basically had Huawei, but I didn't get dropped a single tier for the entire game, so my Huawei just never casted, and it was like pretty bad. But like I had a game like that, it's on my channel somewhere. I think I think just search Recombob Way and it should come up somewhere uh, if you want to see it. But like you know, uh, it, it can put you in some really really wacky spots. Um, then there's some other unique situations. They're often they're not very impactful, right? Uh, but sometimes they can like really like fuck sh shit up, right? Like Diana, like often I never see people play this because by the time it appears usually like you're not you don't really care about remaking your items a lot of times like you're not really selling anything on your board right a lot of times because it could appear at late as late as stage six it's usually like yeah this is my board I'm not selling anything right um Darius there's different versions of this where you gain health right this one's like you gain permanent health there's other ones where it's like put them in the back row and they gain health in, in x amount of fights right a lot of times it's not super impactful right unless you're like doing like a giga roll down like with reroll um this typically doesn't matter but the amount of times that it occurs it's so rare that it's not that big of a deal and then the ones that are combat specific they're not that crazy um teemo rerolling augments a lot of ones that let you reroll your augments in general, they don't really do that much because it basically just helps you like mill the deck. I don't know the right the right phrasing for it, but like if you see an augment, it doesn't get offered later. So if you see Teemo and you reroll all your augments, all the augments that you saw that you didn't take, you won't get offered again later, which will help you if you're trying to hit a particular augment, right? Uh, so that's where it can be abused to uh, to make your board a lot stronger. Um, if you don't know that already, now you know. Uh, but in general, it just helps everybody find something that's useful th for their board. Um, obviously, if someone's high rolling, like if they're like Umbral Spat, then they can like search, they can like roll through everything to find Wrath of the Moon or vice versa, right? There's like some augments that really synergize together and give you like a, an unbeatable spot. And that's where the game could get really fucked up. But other than that, um, you know, it's, it's not the end of the world. 
Uh, same with like Kaisa. Sometimes like you might need a golden item remover, right? The golden remover is like um, the one that you can reuse infinitely. Um, like the extra gold is usually like really good, especially if it's early in the game. But a lot of times everybody just takes remover, um, especially if you're like item holding certain units and you don't have to worry about buy selling units. Uh, you can basically just slam items as much as possible. It's almost always take the remover in my opinion, but that's because I'm a really favored for a remover. I really like it. Uh, but that's what I mean. It's like a unique situation. Sometimes it's useless. I've seen Kaisa get offered um, after a silver augment when you already take a golden remover. And then you're just like pissed off. Because like I could have taken any other silver augment. But other than that, it's fine. Uh, anyways, this was the overview of most of the uh, encounters in the game. I kind of just went over all the ones that I felt like were kind of unique. And then you can extrapolate to whichever uh, encount other encounter you're playing around. Uh, hopefully it wasn't too long. Hopefully it was informative. I know there wasn't like clips and videos back and forth of stuff. It's just really hard to like say like, and look, this is this one video because a lot of times it's like you only see the effect of the encounter like if you watch the whole thing. So um, check out the videos of the entire set. I'm sure you'll see lots of encounters on my channel if you really want to. Thank you for subscriptions. If you like the content, make sure to like and subscribe. Hopefully this was useful to people. Uh, I know it's really late in the set. I wasn't really planning on doing one of these because... You know, when the set started, my channel was like, you know, a third the size. So like, you know, I was just posting VODs as normal. And then people started asking for more tutorials and stuff. So like now it's like, okay, you, you know, for sure I'll make one at, the, you know, next set. I'll be more diligent about making the guides earlier in the set rather than later. Uh, but hopefully this is enjoyable. Uh, and hopefully there was something that you learned from it or something you can take away from it to make your games a little bit more uh, fun or interesting. But love them or hate them. Uh, you know, most of the encounters are probably fine, right? If if you can, greed for the encounters, right? It's always better to have more information and more um, more knowledge on what to play around. And uh, yeah, fuck Kha'Zix. See ya.